Hello, I'm Jamie Liddell. You're watching Fact TV. I mean, whenever you're in a record shop, I mean, these, to be honest, maybe I'm wrong, but they feel like they're getting fewer and farther between, you know what I mean? You don't, you don't really, just to see records in a crate, you know, it kind of puts your whole output in perspective, you know what I mean? You are essentially, you know, you could just be this record. I mean, I, I am essentially this, Nanette Frank. So I mean, that, that is me. Or well, that is anyone who's making a tune. You are basically just adding to this. And like when music is on a computer, when it's all like stacked on a hard drive, you never get a sense of how much there is. You know, you could have thousands of songs. I mean, yeah, it takes a while to scroll through them. But here, this is a tangible thing, you know. These are like weapons, these are like, these are like physical, car these are like carvings, you know. And, uh, you know, these things will stand the test of time. Once our hard drives all break down, you know, these records, you know, obviously some of them probably from the 50s or, you know, they're still going strong, you know what I mean? Because it's actually a sculpture, a sound sculpture, and uh, a great way to store music. Tapes go bad, you have to bake them. Hard drives crash and, you know, break, they're physical. And you lose them, you know. So these things, this just a great, like, I, I forget just how much I like vinyl and the, and the huge artwork and you know and the smell of it. In the digital world, music concrete, it's a lot more pace, 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 reverse, pace, put some reverb on it, yep, nice, reverse, take the whole thing, speed it up, you know, great, done. Back in those days, it was like record, one loop, make another recording, put it up on the wall, second loop, chop it, <laughs> glue it back together again, reverse, and like, man, <coughs> hours later, you know what I mean? You've gone whoop dung, and it's like, yeah. But it's a different journey, you know what I mean? It's just you can't do it, you wouldn't do it on the computer. You just wouldn't be compelled, perhaps, to, to, to chase the same things. So just the physical, and the, the thing is a happy accident that happened when you put the record on the turntable and the sound, and you know, and you're slowing it down. First of all, it's analog, so it's so rich, and you take that for granted, but digital's not like that, you know? It so feels different, it sounds amazing backwards, it just has a quality, and um, I don't know, that's the thing. Those Todd Dockstader records are really, really great little examples of sound. You know, as I've progressed and developed, I've kind of moved away from purely electronic production to sort of taking on board, like, you know, the recording process at large, you know, how do I record? The drums, how do I get that sound on the bass, you know? I mean, it's just like a curiosity really provokes like a lot of my you know, output. Just kind of like, I want to know what it is about that sound, you know? That's sort of like, el that elusive quality to it. So in a way you've got to just do it, I think, rather than just sample it. That was always my conclusion. I wasn't just content with like going, oh yeah, but they've already mastered it. I just sample it off, you know, one of these tracks and then just splice it in. I just was like, well, why can't I try and make it, you know? When, when I started making what I guess you'd call more of a kind of Motown influenced sound, it was kind of an accident, you know, because I was doing a remix from Matthew Herbert and I was, I heard a sort of a uh, little lick in, in the song that he gave me that kind of reminded me of a Motown hook or whatever. So once I started working on the track, I had a limited amount of time. I was like, there's a familiarity to it, you know. Once I had that beat set up and it kind of felt like a Motown thing, I was like, oh man, like a flow on top of this would have been like this, you know what I mean? So it's kind of nice just to be in a realm that you will feel like you understand a little bit sometimes. Mm -hmm. To be in deep space all the time and always feel like you have to be necessarily pioneering, you know what I mean? It's kind of a weird zone. Sometimes you just want to eat a familiar meal, like, and it's and taste how delicious it is. It's like saying, like, just because you're a cook, you always need to be chasing like the most modern cooking techniques, you know, rather than just making something delicious. You know what I mean? If you're making something delicious that feels too familiar, then people might be like, yeah, but he's not innovating, but. You know what I mean? So you, you go through these things in your mind, it's supposed to say, yeah, but as a cook, I just want to make something tasty, you know what I mean? 
So when I think about really what I have listened to in my time, it's basically pop music. So people say, yeah, but you're kind of making a pop sound, what's up with that? Cause you, and I'm like, yeah, but if I think about it, I've always been into pop, you know? That's kind of what I was exposed to. My parents went into record collecting, nor was my sister. I mean, she got into prints and a few handful of other things, you know? And I kind of followed suit. Cause she was older and she cared about it more than me at the time. And, uh, you know, I've gone down various roads. I guess I, I started collecting a little bit of jazz and picked that up on vinyl and, and some dub had that on vinyl, and then, you know, a little bit of electronic music. The 12 inch was a huge thing in the early 90s, and it was brilliant to make them, because it felt like a white label was like this amazing, you know, way to just kind of go, in a way, you could just push your thing out real quick, and you were under the radar, you could do what you, whatever you wanted. When I used to, when I used to search for records in Huntingdon, where I grew up, they had an R price and they had a second-hand section in the R price. And I got some good little gems in there. And it started me down the road of music making and it was so random if I had picked out the tracks. Who knows, you know what I mean? So I picked out Sly and the Family Stone Fresh just because I thought an album cover like that, don't judge a bus cover, but I did. And I was like, how can that be bad? That's insane, you know what I mean? And the same thing happened with Funkadelic, Funkadelic all the faces and like we'd laugh at that cover and go that is insane someone's got to buy that so I ended up buying it and then of course this changed my whole changed my whole life you know so it is cool the way that you know it still makes me realize you've got to get the cover right you know what I mean no matter what people say the cover does does matter a lot of people just say they don't listen, listen to an album all the way through you know and I remember as a kid, I used to get really annoyed if people would give me more than one album for Christmas, you know? I'd be like, well, how am I gonna listen to two? You know what I mean? I remember that feeling, it's like, no, that's too much, I just want one. <laughs> just give me a good one, you know? <laughs> so um, that's it. All I really need to do is walk away with one album from here and then just like study it, you know? Yeah, I met him a couple of times, Quincy. Uh, um, first time I met him was at the Montreux Jazz Festival, it was his birthday. It seems like it's always his birthday. I mean, it obviously falls in the same time. So um, I played this show and the promoter guy was kind of impressed. He goes, I tell you what, you want to come and meet Quincy? And I said, oh yeah, sure, great. Well, I was saying that outwardly inside. I was going, Christ, I'm meet Quincy, this is intense. Do you know what I mean? I had no idea what to expect from Quincy. I thought maybe he could be a real intimidating dude or something. But he went upstairs and he was kind of lounging on the seat, totally just like, just pre-hammered. You know, it's just like, it was his birthday, it was just stretching out. It basically had me in a headlock. I went down to say hi to him, he goes, oh, hi man, you're great. Yeah, I was in a total headlock speaking to Mr. Jones. I was like, yeah, Mr. Jones, you know, it's great to meet you. And he goes, yeah, man. And he goes, what? I was like saying what all the time, like screaming in my ear, and I was just like in the craziest situation. It's just like a photo of me with my arm around Quincy, his arm fully around me, like we're like totally just, you know, best mates or whatever. It's the craziest picture, and somehow, like, I don't know, I met him again actually, and the next time I met him was with Prince. Prince was there too, and it was the weirdest thing, Prince. Prince basically wouldn't look at me. He, I, I, I mean, Prince is my idol, you know what I mean? He, I grew up just totally idolizing Prince. And so I, was, I, was, I didn't know what to expect. I heard so many different stories, like some like he's totally down to earth and he's like actually great guy just to chat with. He loves all kinds of intellectual conversation. And I was like, oh great, you know, cool, you know, I'm down. But anyway, when I finally met him, he just wouldn't, he wouldn't look at me. He just wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he was just looking at the ground, even though I was right there and I'd been asked to come over to meet him. So it was a very intense little moment where I was just like, uh. <laughs> so, you know, but Quincy was there and he's just always like buoyant and bubbly. And I think at one point he patted Prince on the head, <laughs> which was, which is good. I mean, I, I thought, you know, Quincy's not, Quincy knows about egos. 